Here's now here's Nate. Thank you. Thank you. Does it, do I need this? Yeah. Is it working? Is that better? Yes? No? How about now? Yeah. All right. So uh, how many of you have heard me talk before? I know a couple. OK. I know there's one young lady in here that's heard me seven times. So. I had, to, uh, I had to add quite a bit of new stuff because she would be here. So um, I'm not going to finish quite by 5.30, but I will speak very fast, and I doubt that you'll be bored. Um, the war on climate is your topic today. Uh, the subtitle is an invitation to participate in the future. Um, it seems like the right one inch of my screen is not working on here. I don't think I have anything important on there, but if I do, I'll point it out. Um, when I do talks like this, you know, you don't know the audience and it kind of depends on your mood and do you choose door number one where it's going to be fun and everyone's going to laugh and feel good or is it going to be educational or is it going to be helpful um, to your own lives? Door number one is not going to happen tonight. Um, it's, I'm going to try and door number two and number three, there might be some spontaneous humor, but our situation is so complex and uh, a little scary that I want to give people the, the, the larger context that I think climate and caring about the future and some of the things that a lot of you are working on um, in context. So we really face multiple crises, um, psychological, behavioral. Um, half of the people in the world in prison are in this country. Half of the medical prescriptions in the world are in this country. There's more guns than people in this country. You know, those type of things I won't really have time to talk about. Um, the environment is not just climate change and ocean acidification, but that's a big part of it. Um, and then uh, there is also what we use energy for and the economy and um, the ongoing end of growth uh, is something that I'm going to talk about. And for us to really know what we can do about climate, we have to see how the whole picture fits together. Um, and so that's kind of how I'm going to organize this. And about 30 minutes of the talk is going to be on the problem. And then the last 20 or 30 minutes is going to be on uh, using this frame, uh, how can you can help your own life psychologically, behaviorally, um, resilience for the end of growth, and also contribute to uh, a better environment and climate. So let's start out with the economy and energy. Um, in nature, energy is needed for everything. There is uh, heat and light come from the sun. It grows uh, biomass, which are consumed by herbivores and the top of the food chain um, predators. But at every stage, there's an energy input. Energy is needed for everything. And it's the same way in the human economy. We have our primary capital, which is our, our trees and our fossil carbon and our rivers and, and nature, we turn that into uh, secondary capital, which is our machines, our tractors, our toasters, our stuff, and also services. Um, and then on top, we have tertiary capital, which is what people think is real, which is really stocks, bonds, commodities, cash, things that represent real capital. But no matter what we do in the human economy, we first require an energy input. No matter how you make a cup, you need energy, whether it's made with a coconut or uh, plastic or ceramic or tin, you always need an energy input first. So this is uh, me um, on one of my better fashion days. Um, <laughs> that's my horse, and I'm about one-tenth of a horse. A horse is one horse. That's our utility vehicle, which is 45 horsepower, and my truck, which is 150 horsepower. And we take it for granted, everyone in this room was born in a human era where this amount of gasoline, or diesel fuel in this case, will power that truck seven or eight miles down the road in the snow, up and down hills. And can you imagine how much human effort that would take if we had to do it ourselves? So. 
in our economy, since we're just pulling out extracted fuel that took 100 million years or more to refine and turn into this dense liquid fuel, we treat $50 worth of oil the same as we would treat a $50 pair of sunglasses or a $50 pair of boots or sushi or a coffee machine. Uh, in fact, our economists say that the only things that matter are labor and productivity. Energy is not special in our economics textbooks. But we know that energy is incredibly powerful in what it does for us. In fact, 90% um, of the work done on the planet is done by fossil energy. If you add up all the human labor and all of the solar inputs, that's only 10% of the work done on our planet. I don't know if you can see this. Um, okay, so at $75 a barrel, we pay four cents a kilowatt hour for energy. The average American makes $44,000 a year. So in one barrel of oil, there is 1,700 kilowatt hours of potential work. It takes me, I do six tenths of a kilowatt hour in one day. So it takes me around 10 or 11 years to do the amount of work in one barrel of oil. So we can see how uh, this labor has basically explained industrial civilization. Um, and coal is even ch cheaper, though not as, as, as important as, uh, as you'll see. So this, this incredible subsidy that we've gotten from fossil carbon has done a number of things. It's increased wages, it's increased profits, it's reduced the price of stuff that we buy, and it's increased the number of people. Um, so the key story of industrialization is um, we were adding large amounts of cheap energy to replace activities that humans used to do by themselves. For example, uh, we used to walk and then we changed to driving cars where we can get to where we're going 10 times faster but we use hundreds of times more energy. So this is the trade that we did all around the world the last century. Now take a, a local example. Um, if you manually milk a cow, it takes 30 minutes per cow per day. There's zero external energy added. It works out to a wage of around $3 an hour. But then if you use an intermediate um, technology, which are some milking machines, which require less human labor, only 15 minutes per cow per day, a lot more electrical energy, 300 kilowatt hours per cow uh, per year, and you now make $5 an hour. The super automated milking machines are three minutes per human per cow per day, a lot more energy, and a lot more wages. Note that that wage number could be given to the employee, could be given to the owner of the milk factory, could be given to the consumer in lower priced milk. But this is how really cheap, basically indistinguishable from magic fossil pixie dust has supported our lifestyles and our economies. Now, something interesting happens though, because we're adding so many units of fossil energy per product, that when the price of energy goes up, the benefits go down. Here you see how many units of mechanical energy we're adding. The blue line is the hourly wage, and as the, the um, I, I'm sorry, the, the wage is on the left scale, and as um, the price goes up, the benefits decline. You can see it maybe better here, um, that when the, uh, the blue line, uh, the red line, the green line, as we increase the price of energy, the benefits from wages, profits, goods, et cetera, breaks down. And the reason that is, is because we're not just adding one unit of energy to replace one unit of human energy, we're adding thousands, uh, which is the way our, our factories work. You don't see it in your house, but all the products that we have are the result of thousands or tens of thousands times what humans used to do for those same things. So in nature, of course, um, energy uh, return is very important because if a cheetah chases mice all day, it might be very successful, but there's not enough energy in the mice to power what it's doing. So the ratio in nature of how much energy payoff you get for an energy investment 
uh, decides and defines how successful you are as an organism. And the same thing happens in the human sphere. We've found the really easy fossil carbon long ago, and now it's, it's getting lower quality. It's still there. There's still a lot of it, but it's dirtier. It's harder to get. It takes more resources. So there are really, when you think about it, all of us really think about gasoline, oh, it's $3 at, at the pump, and we think that's the cost. But that's only one of the costs. There's different levels of analysis. There's the price at the pump. There's the cost to producers in dollar terms. There's the cost to producers in energy terms. How much energy, forget about dollars, how much actual diesel fuel and natural gas did they need to pull up that oil out of 5,000 feet be below the sea? And then there's, of course, what um, Dr. Hansen was talking about, and some of you have mentioned on the nuclear externalities, is what's the cost to society once we include these, these uh, externalities? So the energy return on investment for discovering oil used to be over 1,000 to 1, and now it's around 5 to 1. We would spend one barrel of oil worth of energy to find new oil out there. So a lot of the good stuff has already been found and is being drilled. Um, the, what do I have next here? The, um, so forget about the, the, if you don't think about the price at the pump for a moment, because that's influenced by money, which I'll get into shortly, the price of extracting oil in the world to the exons of the world has gone up 17% a year for the last 11 years. It continues to go up, which is not what our economic textbooks tell us. They tell us that things get cheaper and cheaper over time, and they did for 50 years or so. Okay, well, most people say, well, yeah, but technology can solve it. We're going to have technology is going to come about. Well, technology in most cases is a vector for more energy use. Most things are, that we do are for using energy are replacing what humans used to do manually. That's the majority of it, like um, driving or lawn mowing or chainsawing. We're used to use axes. There's also new ways that we use energy that we never had before, like Facebook and, and, thing, and the internet and things like that. There's also, we make our power plants more efficient and, and energy conversions. And then there's new energy discoveries, like solar panels and, and things like that. But the vast majority of, of uh, technology actually builds a bigger heat engine in the world and uses more energy. So this is a, a graph of the primary energy sources on the planet the last 200 years. Um, you can see the, the, the beige is biomass, uh, then there's coal in the gray, then oil and natural gas in the red, nuclear in the light blue, hydro in the dark blue, and renewables on, on top. Um, you can see a couple things. One is, with the exception of some recessions, the human heat engine has gotten bigger and bigger over time. You can also see that the beige has started to go up, which means we're starting to use forest products a lot more. Um, where I studied in Vermont, um, it was completely clear cut in the year 1850 and 1860. There were no trees in the state except for up on top of the mountains. We used to use um, timber for food and fuel uh, and heat. The other thing you notice about this graph is when we discover a new energy source, it doesn't replace what we were using. It's kind of an additive thing. There's a time lag in when we have a new energy source going to another one, historically. Okay, money. We can't understand energy, or the environment for that matter, unless we understand money, which are claims that each of us own, or think we own, that are claims on future energy. I have a $100 bill in my pocket. I might go tonight and buy some sushi, and it's a claim on tonight. Or I might save it for 10 years and call in, buy a wheelbarrow or, or whatever. But it's money is a claim on future energy and resources if we understand that energy is really what underpins society. So what they're taught in the, in the schools is that um, banks are intermediaries, that uh, they just move money, existing money, around, and that is not true. Banks create money out of thin air. When you go to the bank and get a loan, as long as you're a creditworthy customer, you get a $100,000 loan, they put 100 grand in your account, and they put an asset in the bank's account at the same time. 
seems okay, it always was okay, except nowhere in the system does $100,000 of purchasing power leave. So at that moment, there are more claims on future oil, gas, trees, water than there were a minute ago. And that is what's happened in our country, well, in the world. Um, there's no biophysical tether to our money system since we went off the gold standard uh, 40 years ago. So if you consider um, declining energy productivity, which is our energy returns are getting lower, where our we have the same thing going on in the financial system where our, our debt productivity is declining. The black line is our GDP and the red line is our debt, just in the United States. So the return, if, if we add a, a billion dollars of debt and we get uh, a billion dollars more of GDP, uh, then it's kind of sustainable, it's one to one. But if we add a billion dollars of debt and we get a smaller increase in GDP, and then a smaller, that's what's been happening in the last 40 years. For every billion dollars of debt, we're only getting like 20 or 30 cents, 20 or 30 percent uh, of GDP. So we're papering over some of our energy problems with paper. <laughs> so if we consider the financial crisis of 2008, which is still ongoing, since 2000 to 2014, world economic output has gone from 41 trillion to 57 trillion. Over the same time, our debt has gone from 87 trillion to 200 trillion. Um, that's a problem. So if you consider that energy and other non-renewable resources are our real capital, and money is a marker for that real capital, at some point, you cross an inflection point where there's too much money relative to the ability to pay it back. I don't know when that point is. Um, I could make a good case that that point happened uh, in the 1970s. Okay, let's uh, briefly talk about the environment. I went under the assumption that most of you are relatively fluent uh, on climate change and related issues, but here are some things that I wanted to say. Um, like I pointed out, this the global society is akin to a heat engine. If you, uh, well, I'll, I'll skip that and come back to it. So if you look at um, the IPCC scenarios, and I, I was surprised to hear Dr. Hansen say this, and pleasantly surprised, that he agreed that many of the more disastrous scenarios, that amount of fossil fuels are not affordable. Because the IPCC, um, until 15 years ago, our government, based their oil supply forecast based on oil demand. There was no geology or anything involved. Whatever demand was, that would be our supply. And I think IPCC is doing the same thing with the fossil fuel forecast. They just assume if it's in the ground, we'll burn it. But they're forgetting about the extraction costs and the benefits that society get. And at some point, you, you don't have the amount of benefits that we're used to if you're spending 20 or 30 percent of your energy to get the energy out. However, that doesn't say anything about uh, nonlinear things like a coal seam fire in China that might burn for 100 years and you can't put out, or methane hydrate burps, or, or things like that. I'm just saying the actual affordability of the fossil fuels. Okay, so this is something that people don't think about much. If you consider an Earth time clock, we're four and a half billion years in almost. Um, the first oxygen was after a couple billion years, these stromatolites, which I collect, um, you know, created oxygen as a byproduct, and then plants and animals came from them. We're in the age of plants and animals now. We only have, d depending on estimates, 500 million to one and a half billion years left before the oceans boil because the sun gets warmer every year. The dark point of me bringing this up is if we mess this up, we ain't going to evolve again. There's not enough time. Um, not just us, but you know, complex, large life. Um, and here's just another pet peeve of mine, is most of the climate literature says, well, by 2100, we're going to do this. Well, the climate doesn't stop in 2100. It's going to keep going. And so t for us to say, yes, this is our objective by 2100, and ignore the nonlinear impacts after that, I think, is, is, is negligent. So um, if we consider um, this is human population over the last couple 3,000 years, and many of you are familiar with this. We've had a moonshot 
in the last 100 or 200 years directly because of fossil fuels. But what most people don't realize is the externality of that is we're, it's not just a war on climate, it's a war on other species. And we're basically committing the ecological equivalent of genocide. 50% of animals are gone since I was born on this planet. 40% insect drop since 1975. Europe's lost 300 million birds uh, in the last 20 years, which is about 25%. There is ongoing mass extinction. We don't know how many species we're losing. I mean, the monarch butterfly is an interesting story, um, but I think it's, it's much, much larger than that, irrespective of climate. It's the size of the human enterprise. Right now, um, this, this is uh, 10,000 years ago. The little red sliver was the biomass if you weighed all the humans that lived then, which was about a million. And the green was all the wild animals' um, estimated weight. Now today, the green slice is wild animal, biomass, terrestrial vertebrates on the planet, all of them. Camels, bears, elk, wildebeest, you know, everything. And the rest, the red is humans, 7.3 billion, and the blue is all of our livestock. Humans and our livestock and our pets outweigh wild animals 60 to one. Whether we do something about climate or not, this concerns me greatly. So this is the last living um, white rhino in South Africa, and they are hired armed guards to protect it. This is from a, like a month ago. Okay, so how do we synthesize where this is? Okay, so the economy turns resources into stuff and services, and then we have financial markers for that. But what's happened is 10,000 years ago, we would do that. We would get together and combine our work and our effort from the ecosystem services of the sun and the rain and the natural forces, and we would generate surplus. The surplus was in grain. It was agricultural surplus. Now what we're doing is we're taking a big chunk out of our non-renewable resources. We're shrinking our actual uh, stuff and increasing the services. Since 2008, we've lost 1.7 million manufacturing jobs and gained 1.7 million bartenders and waitresses, almost the exact amount. And we've got this ballooning financial claims where governments are supporting, printing money, doing other things, which I'll talk about in a second. So the other problem with fossil fuels, of course, is they're so unbelievably cheap that I would rather, if I was a business owner, hire a fossil fuel than hire a person. So real wages in this country went up for 15 decades in a row until the 1970s, and now they're flat. Yet productivity has gone up because we're mechanizing, and in tough times, I'd rather lay off these people with pensions and everything else and hire these carbon workers. So Dr. Hansen also mentioned this, that we have the most emissions um, out of any country. Well, that stands to reason. The last 10 years, the last 30 years, the last 100 years, since the beginning of time, this country has burned more fossil fuels to help us than any other country. Uh, so we talk about you know, the American way and the American lifestyle is non-negotiable. A lot of that was due because we had an empty place with a lot of very high quality resources. But here's the problem, is this extraction increase cost is carried over into the financial system, it's carried over into people's wages, it's carried over into the price of goods. And if you look at the take home pay after cost of living, 95% of Americans have the same or less than they did 10 years ago. Only 5% of people are better off. So for most people, even in one of the richest countries in the world, growth is already over. And I'm sure you yourselves or you know people around here that are really hurting and it's not getting better. Um, this is a direct relationship to our fossil slaves asking for pay raises. Um, and we're not even factoring in the environmental part yet. So what do the world's leaders think about all this? Well. They're following the blue line, which is interest rates. Interest rates are our cost of capital. They're going down. Well, no wonder they're going down. The governments are buying them themselves. But our real cost of capital has gone up 17% a year the last decade. Um, this, is, this is a problem. 
So I really wonder, I don't know how many of you are following what's going on in Greece and, and the Euro and Japan. This was two months ago, uh, the world's finance ministers meeting. Um, how many of them really understand that energy underpins our society? Um, they throw the word growth around in like it's love or hope or something that we can just wish, uh, but it, it has a thermodynamic uh, basis and is different than these things. So right now, um, I can't read my writing, sorry. We have below inflation interest rates, direct liquidity to institutions, guarantees for credit markets, explicit, implicit, too big to fail guarantees, ongoing interventions, quantitative easing, central bank guarantees, all of this is propping up a financial system. How many people in the environmental community are asking what the carbon footprint of quantitative easing is? It's a question that should be asked, but is not. So we talk about growth, and no matter what year it is, all the policymakers in the world will have a forecast of growth of two and a half, between two and three percent for the next decade, no matter what has happened re recently. But what's happening is, is we're using more and more the energy to generate the gross growth, okay? When, when, when they do a lot of extra work in the Bakken, which, by the way, is really in trouble because at 50 at 60 even at $70 in oil, they can't make money in North Dakota. They needed $80, $90, or $100 oil. But we're burning that oil, and so we're getting GDP from it, but the benefits are declining because we're not able to spend it on Disneyland or trips or anything like that because we're spending it on, on the thousands of sand trucks that are going past here every day for the fracking and, and things that we didn't used to have to spend it on. And this has impacts on the economy. So in my opinion, um, and I've spent a lot of time working on this, I think put climate over here for the time being, we are headed for wider and deeper poverty. And in the next 10 years, we're going to have the largest depression this country has ever known, probably the next five, um, but the next 10 anyways. And that is because of the costs are going up for extraction. The other thing that's going to happen is the really energy intensive uh, areas of e the economy, cement, um, planes that aren't full, uh, uh, concrete, aluminum, those things that require a lot of additional inputs of energy are going to become too costly. So we're going to go back down to the intermediate stages. Now in the near term, we can paper this over with money and guarantees, but the engine that drives the economy is, is starting to slow. Okay, so what are some things that would reduce climate risk and save the environment and species? Well, a steep carbon tax. I am 100% in favor of a steep carbon tax. But I am also have thought about what the results of the carbon tax would be, and I'm willing to accept that. Uh, a steep consumption tax, a baby tax. What are some things that would help the economy? Well, kind of the opposite things. Cheaper energy, $50,000 forgivable loan to every American industrialized Africa and the Asian subcontinents. You begin to see that there's a, a, a loggerhead in between the environment and the economic goals. So in our own state, um, the battle between economy and the environment, this is a gasoline price over the last um, five or six years. A couple years ago, gas was 430. Now, we're in the government is trying to get a 16 cent gas tax through. Can't do it, cannot do it yet we're $1.50 lower than we were two years ago. Okay, um, I'll just read this briefly because it, it, it sh I have nothing against our president because I think he's stuck and I'll, I'll get to that in a, in a second, but quotes, now under my administration, America is producing more oil than at any time in the last eight years. That's important to know. Over the last three years, I've directed my administration to open up millions of acres for gas and oil exploration across 23 states. We're opening up more than 75% of our potential oil resources offshore. We've quadrupled the number of operating rigs to a record high. We've added enough new oil and gas pipeline to encircle the earth and then some applause. <laughs> and shortly after, climate change is a fact. And when our children's children look us in the eye and ask if we did all we could leave them a safer, more stable world with new sources of energy, I want us to be able to say, yes, we did. Applause. <laughs> it's not against him. It's the political structure well, I'll get to that right here. Our politicians, our leaders that we elect are kind of in a tough spot. Imagine them saying the things that I just said to you. Our politicians, 
Number one, I want to be reelected, more social status and access for me and my family. Number two, I have no answers for the real questions. Number three, I don't even want to acknowledge the problem is at hand. I don't want to admit I have no idea, and I will do what I think keeps me in power. This is a virtuous cycle. We can talk about this in the Q&A, but real quickly, we are going to 100% renewables. It might take 200 years, might be 50, I don't know. But there, this, the carbon pulse will end eventually. The problem right now is we're trying to build a bigger heat engine, keeping the other stuff going, but adding solar and wind and other things. So the problem is, is that the cost all in is not enough to keep the financial system, which requires new interest every year to pay back the interest from the past. Any combination of renewables and fossil fuels together cannot continue growth. And because we can't continue growth, then we have some other problems. We have political problems, we have poverty problems, we have how do we organize society problems. So yes, going renewables 100% sooner rather than later is a very good idea, but there are consequences that have to be included in that. Uh, I'm gonna skip this for time reasons. Okay, the summary of the problem. We don't face an energy shortage, but rather a longage of expectations. For most, not all people, growth is already ending. Current consumption levels are being supported by central banks creating money and guarantees around the world. A carbon tax is a tax on 90% of our workers and counter to GDP, and we can talk about that in the Q&A. Solar and wind are getting cheaper, but not cheap enough to continue growth. We need larger than baby steps, but our policies and institutions were designed for baby steps. We are unlikely to do much in advance, advance of a crisis. The main difference between us sitting in this room and earlier humans is A, we're using fossil carbon as a main energy source, and B, we figured all this stuff out, which has to be worth something. Okay, um, Emily, where are you? Is Emily here? Oh, hi, okay. So this is the new stuff that I added. Um, okay, so some of you might be thinking, wow, this is exactly what I think. This is great. Others of you might be thinking, if that's the case, why aren't other people talking about this? Why don't I hear it in the media? Why don't I hear it at you know, dinner parties? And some of you might be thinking, this guy is full of shit. I can't wait for dinner. And the reason, the reason that we feel this way is that the brain is like a gyroscope that reacts to incoming things that is, makes us more healthy. And I'm gonna give you a very quick run through of six cognitive biases that are prevalent in our species. Um, in the same way that uh, the monarch has the grandchildren and the great-grandchildren eventually make it down to Mexico, that's in their DNA. Well, these belief systems are in our DNA. And then I'm gonna get to potential sol solutions. Okay, cognitive dissonance, many of you are aware of this that uh, Jared Diamond in the book Collapse gave the example of a dam that was about to break and people three miles downstream were very worried and people two miles downstream were like freaked out, like super worried, calling the police, what do we do? And people within one mile of downstream were calm and not worried at all. And if you think about that, it's really ubiquitous in our society and I think these climate change and peak oil and financial collapse and the great extinction, I, it's more than our ancestors had to deal with. So we create defense buffers and mechanisms that suppress it internally. And it takes a while to you know, recognize that, cognitive dissonance. So we knew 100 years ago that CO2 uh, was a temperature greenhouse gas. We knew 50 years ago that uh, it could potentially uh, disrupt our future climate. Then we got a lot more information on the details. And it actually um, is a very urgent thing that we need scientists and citizens to get together. And, oh, did that last picture look kind of like a monster? No, let's have a beer and pizza. Holy shit, Godzilla is in Red Wing. <laughs> so this, this is a phenomenon um, that I would call time bias, is humans and all other biological organisms are hyper-focused on the present. The present, the next 10 minutes, and the present, the last 10 minutes, called the recency effect. So uh, James Schlesinger, the former head of the CIA and Secretary of Energy, who after one of my talks gave me a hug, by the way, um, we, he said in 1979, we have only two modes, Americans, complacency and panic. And this is what's called time bias. Um, 
Confirmation bias, motivated reasoning. I put the example up here of the 9-11 was an inside job. I could have put up a lot of different examples. What people do is if someone believes 9-11 was an inside job, which I patently do not believe, they will go to websites that explain why that is. They will not go to websites showing scientific proof of why it was not. All of us use confirmation bias where we check out our own news sources and the things we're used to that give us confirmatory uh, pats on the back that we're right. And not only that, but it becomes motivated reasoning, which inv uh, involves our emotions. We actually emotionally need it to be right and go to lengths that when we're given facts about climate change, for example, that show it's undeniably real and urgent, we will actually go out of our way to make those facts not true. In other words, we'll, we'll debate beyond the point of the relevance of the facts. In-group bias, conformity bias, there's a famous uh, test called the ASH experiment from 50 years ago where they had eight people in a room and one of them was the real scientific study, like a student, and the other seven were confederates. And they would always tell, they, that person would go last. And in this case, they said, which of the lines over here best matches the line over here? And when the seven people said, oh, it's line number C, the, obviously the eighth person's like, really? It doesn't look that way to me, but okay, C. 70% of people went along with the consensus even though they knew it was wrong. This is called conformity bias, in-group bias. We really care about social status of our, inner, our group, even if the group is randomly assigned in some scientific study. Optimism bias. We all think we are better than we really are. Um, optimism, just being optimistic in life reduces um, cortisol, which is a stress hormone. It boosts helper T cells, which is good for our immune system. 92% uh, of college professors think they're better than average at teaching. There's all kinds of examples like this. Why? Because it was adaptive. To think that I suck, if I went out of my house and everything I did sucked, I wouldn't succeed in my life. So, this is a natural uh, evolutionary response. Authority bias. Science has shown that if someone is charismatic and emphatic um, and in a position of authority, we will believe what they say, even if at the simultaneous time we're showing a person with proven credentials that is a, a, an expert in that matter, we will believe the authority figure who speaks with charisma more. Ideological immunity, I think this is my last one of these, is it, it's, it shows that the smarter someone is measured by an IQ test, which is imperfect, I would agree, um, the more able they are to defend their viewpoint and debate other people. There's a correlation that the smarter people are, the better they are at debating alternative viewpoints to their own. And it makes you wonder, is, is the adaptation of human intelligence, was it so that we could progress or was it because we could debate people in our tribe and win arguments? There's more biases. There's actually thousands of them. Um, and I'm not going to go through them. But the point is, is that our brains are modular and integrated. We have, right now, everyone in this room has a tiny little area of their brain that is scanning for snakes. And in the fourth, room, the fourth row, I did bring my pet coral snake and it's slithering around there. Yeah, no, but we have all these things working at once and they don't agree with each other. They don't have to agree with each other. It's whichever one shouts the loudest gets our attention at the moment. Um, so what's really happening here is we've got a real physical world and then we have a virtual world in our brain. And some peoples are really disconnected and other peoples are closer. <laughs> but humans are naturally, we're human first and we're scientists second. So the whole uh, uh, edifice of science is an attempt to get us closer to the real physical world. And then I think you have to synthesize science as well because just knowing physics without knowing all this other stuff, you don't quite get the whole story. Um, so, okay, how do we solve these problems? I don't know. <laughs> and I think whatever my opinion is, I think the answer to these issues we face is probably going to be different for a lot of different people. I think you have to think about yourself. 
you think about your family and your community, you think about the United States or the Midwest, you think about other species maybe, or other generations. So there's all different lenses of how to view this problem. Some people will be kind of normal, just like this circle. Other people will be like this. They really only care about themselves. That might not be a bad person, but that's really what their focus is. Other people might really care just a little bit about themselves and care a lot about other species and about the future. This people are in the minority, but we need some of these people uh, in our culture for absolute sure. Okay, so with that little diagram fitting in the middle of uh, psychology, environment, and economy and end of growth, I am going to give you some suggestions on what we do. And the reason I'm here is I've stopped speaking uh, because I'm writing a book and, and focus on some other things, but I will speak locally. And you all people are in my community, so I want Red Wing to play a role, uh, and Minnesota, in, in, what's, in what's coming. So um, I don't see a clear move right now to make for solving climate change. My own personal opinion is there's only one way that we're going to solve climate, and that's massive economic deterioration the world over uh, for generations. Um, and yet, maybe we get lucky and we still emit carbon for 30, 40, 50 more years at a smaller amount and some buffering effect that we don't know. I mean, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a climate scientist, but that's my opinion. But I think what we want to do is have more people on the, on the chessboard so that when there is something that we can vote for, if Bernie Sanders gets elected and we have a carbon tax and yes, we're gonna tighten our belts and do this thing, there is a population of people, the Citizens Climate Lobby, James said it doubled the last few years, we needed to go up 100 times, you know, that sort of thing. But in order to have game moves down the road, we need to have game moves closer first. We need people to stay in the game because it's not just climate, it's also your wages and your you know, your job and, and your everything else. So with that said, let's start on some suggestions for being personally resilient in our energy and uh, growth future. So some of you know that before I was doing what I'm doing now, I worked on Wall Street, kind of the dark side. <laughs> and uh, there, were, there were years where I made a half a million dollars. And those years, I spent all of it. I wasn't quite Wolf of Wall Street type, because I never did drugs or anything, but I had massive parties. You know, my apartment was bigger than this room. I blew it all. And now I live on 45 grand a year, and I've never been happier in my life. I changed what has meaning to me. And I've also surrounded myself with people that care about real things and not about how they could just high five. I just made a $20,000 commission off this billionaire. I've, I've changed who my group is. So if we look at um, energy use on the bottom per capita and subjective well-being on the left axis, there's not a whole lot of correlation between those people very happy and the energy use. The United States uses twice the energy of people in the Netherlands about as very happy. We use 38 times the energy of the average person in the Philippines just as happy. Now, if anyone in this room moved to the Philippines, they would be miserable because they're not used to that. But if all of us were living like that, we would probably be reasonably happy, just saying. So this is a, a, a very ubiquitous thing in sociology where um, massive lifestyle improvements happen when you're really poor and you get some things, some energy, some food, some water, some sanitation, some medical care. And then after around fifty or $60,000 a year, your life satisfaction levels off. And as a former money manager of billionaires, I can tell you that that line on the top starts to come down at some point. Okay, so number one suggestion, redefine what wealth means to you and others. So my little acronym here is uh, from less to enough. Less could stand for less energy stuff and stimulation. Enough would be ecology, nature, utility, friends, and family. A friend of mine who some of you might read, John Michael Greer, says collapse first and beat the rush. And I think it's kind of a pithy phrase, but it's not necessarily to stop using carbon, but it's to make you personally more resilient to, to what's coming. 
Okay, I'll go through this real quickly. There's been tests on animals and humans that when we experience something that we like, a reward, uh, paradoxically, you would think, okay, in this case, a, a monkey uh, hears some sound and gets some fruit juice. You would think that when he got the fruit juice is when he, when he would get his uh, neurotransmitter reward, but that's not what happens. He gets the neurotransmitter reward at the tone that signals that fruit juice would be coming. This is very, very important for our consumptive lifestyle because it shows basically that buying things is the motivator and having things is not the motivator. The wanting is stronger than the having. Some of you may know, well, probably three of you know, that I like to, ca I like to collect um, uh, agates and stromatolites, one of my low carbon pastimes. I now have buckets of them at my house. I don't care about the ones I own. I like the finding of them. And if you think about that dynamic, you can expand that to our entire culture. One more shopping center, one more rainforest cut down, one more orgasm, one more skyscraper. It's about the experience, not about the result. We have flow-based brains in a stock-based world. It's a disconnect. So if you think about um, this, and uh, in your mind think of a few graphs ago and this, is there is a point where we have enough. And then beyond that, it's, it's, it's not good. So the, the suggestion here is to recognize this dynamic and resist meaningless consumption. This is not a picture of my storage shed because I didn't have time to get it, but my storage shed is way worse than this. And it's stuff from when I got my PhD 10 years ago. I, you know, paintings and battery, I've never even been in there in three years. Um, so, okay, uh, suggestion number three, don't just stand there, be useful. Um, I think we need to have people with real skills, MacGyver skills, or cooking skills, or small engine skills, things that you can do. Okay, so another main driver of our behavior is relative fitness, relative to other people. And this is a core precept in biology in nature. So just think real quickly, Emily, this is the eighth time you've heard this now. Would you prefer a 4,000 square foot house in a neighborhood where all the people, your neighbors had bigger houses? Or would you prefer a 3,000 square foot house where all your neighbors had smaller houses? Would you want a smaller house if your neighbor's houses were smaller? Most people would say yes. They care about relative to others. Um, there's lots of examples in the literature here is if I want to make 60 grand a year or I'll make 50 grand a year if all my buddies are making 40. It's, it's very prevalent in human behavior. So uh, my fourth recommendation is we are living in one of the richest times in history. Enjoy absolute wealth rather than relative wealth because believe me, I've caught up with Jones twice in my life and he's an idiot. Uh, okay. Um, so knowing that right now um, oil is depressed, and there are some reasons for that, but it's not going to last long, energy is going to get more expensive throughout your lifetimes. And there could be an economic depression, and it could go down, but over time it's going to get more expensive, which is going to limit some of the things that we do. Buying things from New Zealand is not going to be commonplace uh, in 10 years. We're still going to have globalization, but I would expect that sort of transport is going to decline. So become more flexible and adaptable. Don't get a job that's 80 miles away and you have a 150 mile daily commute. Not only yourself, but we need to think about localizing and regionalizing supply chains. We can't have little components for our wind turbines and solar panels coming from, uh, well, I was going to say Korea, but yeah, China. China's in really deep doo-doo right now. They are underpinning their market. They made it illegal yesterday to short sell. Like if you're short selling in the market, you could get arrested and like killed. So they are trying to support their stock market by any means possible. They're buying stocks, the government is. I mean, it, it could work, but not forever. So the, yeah, we need to localize and regionalize supply chains. Uh, and the final suggestion in this little section is help create cross-generational tech, not gadgets. There's a billionaire named Peter Thiel whose tagline is, we wanted flying cars and we got 150 characters. 
uh, reference to Twitter is a lot of the things that we're developing are just giving us quick bursts of dopamine and they're not helping the future. Okay, moving on to the psychological component of my suggestions for what you might do. So when you hear about all this doom and gloom stuff, it actually takes uh, an outsized portion of your brain, uh, at least temporarily, and it's probably too large relative to the reality. So the reality of the Grim Reaper is, is real, but it's smaller. Um, so we, I think we need to expand our capacity for uncertainty. We just don't know. And the future is not yet determined, which is why we need CCL and other organizations to fight for things that we really care about. Um, <laughs> so the, the caption is, it keeps me from looking at my phone every two seconds. So I, I would recommend not to reduce your energy use, but to make your brain healthier, especially for the younger people in the audience, is to go on internet, social media, and even electricity holidays, uh, especially television. And I, I think it's just good for our brains to be more in tune with the real uh, natural flows of the earth rather than the technology. Uh, number three is try to narrow the gap between the virtual and real worlds. Um, that you do by education and discussion with smart people and reading. Um, and maybe reflection without any social media or anyone around you. Just look outside at nature for 10 or 20 minutes a day and, and you, know, you can get a sense for what's really happening. Number four is if you're very afraid of something. Um, when I started my own hedge fund, I was good at making money for myself, but as soon as I risked it for other people, I got really scared. And I hired this neurolinguistic psychologist to tell me what to do. And he said, you need to lean into your fear. And so I had to practice, and I was deathly afraid of spiders at the time, and I got to the point where I could pet the marbled orb weavers in my house to overcome the fear. And when you, your natural tendency when you're afraid of something is to move away from it, when actually the healthier thing is to move towards it within limits. Um. <laughs> so um, we have a lot of things shouting at us, and some people would argue the, the element of free will. And I would say that what we need to do is practice free won't, um, which is make the things that we really care about uh, in, on the right here, uh, biodiversity, climate change, energy depletion. We need to be able to develop at least a little bit of an impulse control. Uh, on that note, when a crisis hits us, we react. So I think to, this is more of an advanced suggestion, to build neural structures for when tomorrow becomes today, kind of like having a parallel self, uh, envisioning role playing in the future of how you will react when something happens. Uh, and then it's important that you don't get bogged down. This stuff we're talking about is freaking toxic. I have to take five hours a day and go for hikes and take naps and do stupid mundane things because talking about you know, the climate disruption and the biodiversity loss that we're facing, not to mention the end of growth and these other things, is really heavy. And so you have to be kind to yourself and devote your three hours a day to this or whatever and, and you know, live and laugh uh, a lot. Uh, the final part of this section is that we, because of our in-group, um, is someone hissing at me? <laughs> what? Oh, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. E excellent. Thank you for the segue. It is natural for us to blame others for our problems. It is from our tribal past. It is very easy for us to pick a scapegoat and say, things would be better if it weren't for the Chinese, if it weren't for the Republicans, if it weren't for those poor people, if it weren't for the greedy rich, if it weren't for the tree huggers. Um, this is a natural part of our brain delusionality. Well, in this case, it's none of these people's fault, really. What's happening is our fossil coworkers are asking for raises, and they're also pooping and breathing, which we're discovering is bad. But it's not really any of these people's fault. Now, I don't like some of these people, but that is a separate issue. So we just heard this week that there were 30, 40 year buried memos that the fossil fuel companies were aware that climate change was a risk and they were suppressed. But you know what? Blaming Exxon for climate change is like blaming 
Hitler's gallbladder for the Holocaust. It's too specific to be valid. We are all complicit in this. And I think it's, it's just very superficial and doesn't deep, delve deep enough into what we really face to just have a scapegoat and say, it's the dirty fossil fuel companies. On that note, I think the recommendation is to avoid blaming others and take ownership and responsibility. How many of you are really looking forward to the next election? Because that next president is going to change things for us. No, I'm not. Okay, well, <laughs> oh, maybe if Bernie Sanders got in or something like that. But my point is that we put too much pressure and too much reliance on others when we need to look in the mirror a little bit. Um, there are sociopaths in fossil fuel industry, but there are also sociopathic lawyers and doctors and people on Wall Street and real estate developers. Uh, and there's very good people in the fossil fuel industry as well. Bishops. And bishops, sociopathic bishops, thank you. Okay, so I'm nearing the conclusion of my talk and we still have some things to do about why you came today, which is what to do about climate change, what to do about the environment, what to do about the uh, sixth great extinction. And I think some of the things I'm going to say now are a little controversial uh, and maybe don't feel good, but maybe that's okay. Um, Uncle Tom's Cabin was written in the 1860s before the internet, Emily. Um, and so people then, they could read and then they would get angry. And what they would do is go out and riot or go out and argue or go out and do something. Now when we read something that makes us sad or pissed off, we write a blog post or we tweet. And what happens then is the dissonance in your brain disappears. The intelligent raging that was there is dispotentiated. It's gone because I, I expelled it in, in, in the ether because I was so clever and boy, I told them. Um, so I would argue that at the margin, yes, we need social media, we need education on these issues, but you need to balance it with actually doing things, and, and so blogging isn't doing the trick. Neither is reducing consumption. Given what we face to go living off the grid and buy an electric car or give up uh, factory farm meat or any meat for that matter, these are all good things, but we need warriors and mystics what we face now, someone living off the grid is doing about the same for climate change as Donald Trump. Well, maybe not that bad, but, but you know what my point is, is that we need a rapid reduction. We don't need a little bit of a marginal reduction, and if you just reduce and the whole heat engine keeps getting bigger, someone in China is gonna use what you didn't. So I, I believe we need more warriors and mystics. We also need uh, diplomatic dialogue between this group well, I, this group being the Citizens Climate Lobby, and the people that create our supply chains of food and energy and sanitation and things, that there's a physical infrastructure and there's an environmental story, and those people aren't talking to each other. Uh, we need to strengthen the agenda of the self-aware mind versus the agenda of the gene. This is kind of an advanced thing, and since we're close to dinner, we'll talk about it later if you'd like. This is relevant though to you, is we need to scale renewable energy, but not because let's just use all this and do it with solar panels instead. Because I think some of us with resources can do that. Everyone can't because we don't have that amount of cheap capital that we once did. So my suggestion is to re use renewable energy, but not to build a bigger heat engine. If we look at the same curve of diminishing marginal returns, I get a hell of a lot of utility from my one watt that my cell phone used, or the 10 watts of a computer. The first few hundred watts are, are precious, but the ability for me to bake two turkeys in the oven at three in the morning, I don't really need that. So the very radical suggestion is that in our country, and around the world, we need pilots for people living without baseload. That sounds radical, but it's gonna happen in 20 years, in 30 years, in 15 years. We need examples of, of how that works. So we also need to consider that we're taking 35% of the net primary productivity of the planet, we're taking more than our share. And we need people to educate and inspire others on new 
cultural aspirations and values, which includes putting your foot down and saying, this is unacceptable to me. This is not what I stand for. And we need to welcome and consider alien thinking because conventional, <laughs> conventional thinking has, has gotten us in a hole and we're digging the hole uh, bigger. Okay, some general suggestions that don't fall under those, and I'm almost done, is the human ecosystem, what we do is we take energy and non-renewable resources and turn it into dollars. We turn the dollars into feelings. Those feelings are what our evolutionary ancestors had when they met with success in finding mates and resources, plus waste. But we don't need to use all that energy to get those same neurotransmitters. Um, so in the future, this is also gonna be what the human ecosystem will be, but maybe we can have less waste and the same or better feelings depending on what culture ascribes to. Now, I was gonna say that everyone should get in the best shape of their life and lose weight, but I'm 265 pounds standing here. I can't really tell you that. So, but I, I do think physical uh, human capital is very important. So when we talk about financial chaos and end of growth, the natural reaction to a lot of Americans is, oh, I'm gonna buy gold, I'm gonna buy guns. And you laugh, but it, that is true. But I think we need to look a step beyond that. And instead of saying, oh, if this happens and there's a Great Depression in Red Wing and things are gonna, supply chains are gonna shrink and we're gonna have an incredibly local economy and do I buy guns or gold? I think a better question is, think about what you would do then to help your community. How can I help? Ask that now. If that happened, how would I help people around here? What would I do? And whatever the answer is to that question, start thinking about those things now and building those skills and that mindset. Um, this is a very, very heavy topic, so I'm not going to end on this, but I, I think the discussions, humans, one of our monkey reactions is we respond very well to people talking about equity and equality. And we respond very poorly to people talking about the rich get this and everyone else doesn't get anything. Talking about equality is part of a social requirement for approval. Equality has various delineations of boundaries? Are we talking about Americans? Are we talking about humans alive today? Are we talking about all humans that might potentially live in the future? Are we talking about other species? I do not think that equality and solving climate change um, can both happen, my opinion. So I don't know which of these things will be helpful, or if any. I think there's a million possible things that we collectively as a society need to try and work on to make the future better. And we don't know which ones will be trivial or which ones might have outsized impact. And I think for me, learning about all this stuff has been quite a journey. And I've decided I don't know what to do. But what I want to do is on my deathbed, I want to die liking myself. And in order to die liking yourself, of course, you have to live liking yourself. In order to live liking yourself, you have to ask yourself, what do you stand for? And I've asked myself what I stand for. And I stand for consilience of knowledge, kindness. I consider myself a citizen of a full planet. And I care about deep time coexistence of humans with other large complex life. This is what I stand for. And I, I would uh, exhort all of you to ask yourself what you stand for. I'm sure it's different things. So, uh, in closing, I think we need more people on the game board of changing our culture, protecting our environment, and living differently within limits. And I really hope that um, Minnesota is on that game board. So my advice is uh, change the goal and stay in the game. Thank you. So I guess we're, we're kind of over a little bit, but why don't we take 15 minutes of questions, if there are some, and then everyone go outside. You want to go outside now, go ahead, and then we'll have like 15 minutes of questions, and then we can meet outside and, and discuss more.
I have a friend, Ken Pentel, who's... Peter, go ahead. Is it, is it working? Yes. I have a friend named Ken Pentel. He started a, a, um, something called the Ecology Democracy Network. He's talked about the genuine progress indicator, saying that the gross domestic product does not accurately measure what needs to be measured. It measures pollution as growth. Yes. So he has, um, the genuine progress indicator would give value to forests for right. being there. Value yeah. to people who don't earn money doing what volunteer work, and most wives and mothers have done that for millennia. So that's one thing that the genuine progress indicator would measure. And as far as James Hansen is concerned, nuclear power is not carbon neutral. Building it, and you know, if James Hansen thinks that uranium and nuclear power is great, then he should go to uranium mine and mine it himself. Thank you. I'll respond briefly to both of your points. Number one is the genuine progress indicator um, peaked in 1978 and has been declining. It obviously, as you pointed out, oil spills and rape counseling and things like that get added to GDP. It includes bads as well as goods. So definitely we need to move. Uh, the kingdom of Bhutan has moved to gross national happiness as an objective. We need to move in that direction. But here's the problem, is the people that own the creditors in this country own GDP and what it produces. We can't pay them back in GPI certificates. So there's that bridge that needs to be crossed. Your second comment is a correct one, although nuclear fuel over a very long time would be relatively low carbon, but solar and wind are also not carbon free. Look at all the industrial machinery that goes into making those and each component of those has incredibly huge industrial factories to produce it in mass producing. So what we're talking about is reducing carbon, not eliminating carbon, I think. But thank you. Oh, I had heard once that um, a good question is better than an answer. So uh, that's what I like about the question response deal. They've been good questions. Well, what I'm thinking of is um, it, it seems like over the years I've learned to, to maybe do the opposite of what the majority, like the line thing, if everybody thought it was the wrong line and I thought it was the right line, um, I'd want to stick to that, you know. And to me, it's, I think most of this crowd, too, would go against the majority. But in a way, we have to teach children, uh, I call it holy disobedience. You know, we've got to get children to... I did a lot of that. <laughs> Good. That's why you're where you are, I bet you. I think I did a little. But how do we... But really, the school systems do not teach children to be uh, different or to be disobedient yeah. at the right time. And the soldiers, they should have been taught disobedience a long time ago. You know? So how do you teach disobedience properly? Well, it, it, that gets to the question of, um, of our education system. Our education system now is to filter people properly into uh, the workforce to get jobs. It's not really to learn. Um, so I, I think we really, and not only that, but kids are coming out of college with six-figure debts, then there's no jobs to pay it off. So our whole education system needs an overhaul. And, uh, you know, that's a very good point. And I, I think we need to think about it hard because it's the next generation of what they learn. I, mean, I would love to see 200 years from now, however many people live on the planet, if they're all like quoting Herman Daly and they know ecology when they're in eighth grade, that I would view as a success. Yes, sir. I know this question might go against perhaps a major thing that you've been talking about, but I really don't understand it. And I just, I plead ignorance and hopefully you can put some light on this. We owe trillions and trillions of dollars. I guess most of that to China, if I understand correctly. I, well, I, I don't know. Like I said, mm -hmm. I'm not very good in economics. But if we owe that much money in debt, mm -hmm. what does that mean? Okay. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll try, the, try this, okay? So there's two lenses with which to view debt. One lens is what most of us consider, which is if there's this much debt, then there's got to be this much credit. It's a zero-sum game, right? If there's 100 trillion here, there's 100 trillion there. It's a zero-sum game. And that is a wealth inequality issue that a lot of people have, a very small amount of people have a lot of the credit. 
But the other issue is when money comes into existence, it's matched creditor and debtor, but no one asks the energy and non-renewable resources when the money is issued. So the second lens is kind of a Ponzi mentality, which is all of this money, whether it's the interest, uh, I mean the, the money in your checking account, the money in your pocket, the, your stocks, your bonds, all that stuff requires a future return that is predicated on, in our case, cheap fossil fuels and other non-renewable uh, resources like copper and, and things like that. So in some sense, it's a zero-sum game, and in other sense, it's a larger and larger claims on the future of, of stuff. And yeah, we owe, you know, we have, 18 trillion in government debt, but we also have personal debt, corporate debt, uh, household debt, financial debt. There's there's various layers. Okay, you're probably more confused than than you were. <laughs> it's a long story. Um, don't worry about it. I'm, I'm a planning commission on a, on a local planning commission, and I've gone to meetings and said things like, we don't want to have to ship our corn from Iowa, let alone from South Dakota, I mean, from South America. And I'm wondering if I can use you as a, <laughs> as a resource when I make Absolutely. this. Absolutely. Okay. And the next question is, um, you have a, an acute ability to bring many things together. How long till I have to? Do I have to wait to read your book? Because the ability to bring in the psychology, Kahneman and Tversky, and biases and Jonathan Haidt type stuff just makes me insane. I can't. Those wait. are great references. The, the answer is, um, to be honest, is I got fed up with Wall Street in 1999. I gave my clients back uh, their money in 2001. I started reading books, and I had. $500,000 in the bank at that time. So I kind of just lived off that. I traded a little bit. I went hiking for six months with my dog at a time with a backpack full of books by Herman Daly and Ishmael and all these things. So the, it's taken me 40 hours a week for 10 years of reading. Uh, so I'm trying to condense that down into one hour. But, you know, you, you know I'm, and now I read science fiction and fantasy because my head like explodes if I read more about climate change. So I try in every third book be a, a nonfiction book, but I'm, I'm failing at that. Uh, because you, you, know, you, just need, you don't need to know all the reductionist details about one thing. You just need to kind of know. We need more generalist knowledge instead of reductionist knowledge, in my opinion. Good point. You must be an uh, operations research major. No, no, Chinese and business. OK. Uh, now the real question is, do you think we should try and get the kind of activity going that we did in the year 1998 when everybody was worried about year 2K? Or is that under, uh, on, the, is it, on the environmental side or on, on the, on, on the end of growth side? On, on the, the carbon. Growth, on the end, both of those. Do you think we should try well, and use we that need, emergency? We need to do something that leapfrogs our evolutionary time bias, that we everything is fine, let's party. This might happen in the future. Especially, OK, so the end of growth is one issue. The carbon issue, we have no chance if we wait too long. There's one planet Earth. But how do we trick our brains into acting as if it's that urgent? So yes, I mean, if I was in charge, I would create some false thing with billions of Madison Avenue dollars behind it that aliens were attacking us. <laughs> because if aliens were attacking us, we would suddenly all 7.3 billion humans become one in-group. And we would carpool and stay at home and eat mac and cheese and nothing else and do whatever the government would tell us. But I can't conceive of any way to make the Chinese and us and, you know, the rich and the poor. I mean, it's very difficult to become one in-group. But that is a narrative that needs to happen is we are at war with the future. And so, I don't know. I mean, I think it's a good idea. I don't know how to put it in practice. Okay. Thank you. Sure. So maybe we, oh, this is a line? Okay, yeah. a couple more questions and it's kind of hot and people are. Okay, I just, could you explain a little bit more about why um, we cannot address climate change and um, try to work towards equality? Or at least even reach it, you know? Um, because I'm not understanding that. Thank you. Well, I think in some ways we will accomplish that because I think there will be a financial crash in the next 10 or 20 years and so a lot of the rich people will become poor um, and therefore we will be equal at that point. Um, that's kind of a dark answer to your question. But let's talk about uh, carbon fee and dividend. 
um, and then I'll get to your part of the question. We are focused on the economics of it, and we conflate that we're misunderstanding the energy part and the economics part. If we tax gasoline a dollar and give the dollar to these people over here, then we've reduced carbon, except we're forgetting about the fact that they might spend that dollar on Starbucks or Walmart or something that has a second derivative of fossil inputs in it. But the larger thing that's missing is that we take a dollar out of gasoline tax and we take $60 of work out of the economy because gasoline is incredibly powerful. So if we remove the carbon, we're removing the work that the carbon does. Now, we might be happier and healthier because of that, but we're going to be poor. Maybe not you and I will be poor, but society and aggregate, somewhere in the system, there'll be lower wages, lower profits, higher priced stuff. Um, so you can see where that leads to um, equality is, is there's a lot of poor people. We have incredible inequality now. Um, and so what happens when we get poor? Me personally, if I could know that my actions would impact the future in a positive way and that the future, that in 50,000 years there would be living oceans, I would give up just about anything. I would want coffee in the morning, a tent, a walk with my dog, meaningful work, and medical care. I wouldn't need anything else, and the coffee would be optional. So I would be willing to give up a lot, but most people, there's something called loss aversion, that when you start with $10,000 and you gain 1,000 and you're at 11,000, and they measure your brain chemicals, and then when you go back from 11,000 to 10,000, the negative feelings are way stronger than the positive feelings in going up. And you see it when you have two dogs that are playing, you give one of them a bone, the, the whole dynamic changes. And I, I think, you know, given that you're veterans for peace and you really care about that, I think you're gonna have a big job in the next 10 years because we are gonna need to be peaceful to each other um, uh, more so than in the past, in my opinion. And that didn't really answer your question, but maybe it got part way there. I was going to ask you to just back the frame up to the second to the last frame that you had there. Disconnect. And it's disconnected. It's disconnected? Oh, oh it's oh. disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the question. I just wanted to think about what uh, you, you're, you know, kind of find all that. I just wanted this to will be online, thing. right? You're yeah. going to post this so you can watch it and... <laughs> Yeah. I'm looking for there's the uh, GDP, which is essentially uh, pretty much run by the very elite, uh, wealthy people of this country. And then we have a 60 percent of the population that says that climate change is extremely important, a concern of theirs. Um, and it seems that, um, as I recall, the answer to uh, terrorism was we had to go shop. Um, that that was the number one thing, that consumerisms, that's what we're really good for is consuming. Uh, so why don't we stick a uh, stick a, uh, a stick in their wheel by not buying, uh, having, uh, holding off and saying we're not going to buy one day a week or something like that. I think that's an excellent idea. <clears throat> I mean, it just seems crazy to me that we just keep handing them the money and telling them you lead us by the nose. You organize it, I'll sign up. <laughs> okay, good. You're there. <laughs> so, I, I, are you wanting to quit? No, I don't mind. It's just hot in here and people are hungry. I don't mind. Yeah. I'll stay as long as you want. Okay, so um, I have a question that came from your last, the, the conversation we said about people being poorer. Now, in the United States, there is so much stupid stuff that if we could selectively get rid of the stupid stuff, being poorer would be fine. Have you thought of any way to do that? I think for 40% or so of Americans, a reduction in consumption would make them happier and healthier. But 50% yeah. of Americans truly basically have nothing. They have less than mm -hmm. three months of income saved. If they uh -huh. lost their jobs in three months, they would have zero. So we're going to have to deal with soup kitchens and mm -hmm. medical care and all those things. So there is going to have to be some sharing going on. Whether it's voluntary or forced, I, I don't know. Uh, but I think for a lot of people, reducing their consumption will make them happier and healthier. Right. That's kind of is like how to manage that. I'm growing food, by the way. <laughs> Anybody want to help? Um, the community rights movement, uh, community environmental legal defense fund, and those whole things, do you have a perspective on the stuff they're doing? This is not fair to ask in front of the group. <laughs> uh, let's take that offline. Yeah. I, I do have some thoughts on that. Yeah. Were, were there more questions? 
Yeah. Thank you. Um, have you seen the REMI study that CCL commissioned that looks at the economic impact of fee and dividend? Um, yes. And it shows that the economy doesn't suffer, but it grows. Um, GDP goes up. And then also um, British Columbia has had fee and dividend for a number of years, and they have seen economic growth, and also um, an increase in their use of low carbon technologies. So I'm just wondering how that fits. I, I don't. I disagree with the Remy report um, for some of the issues because I don't think they used a biophysical perspective. British Columbia at one time could have been a good example, but it's a failed example. They stopped at $35 a ton. Their carbon uh, consumption flatlined and went down a little bit for five or six years. Now it's it, now they've rehauled that and it's expected to increase the next 10 years in a row. And what happened was that the carbon tax there, a lot of people drove into Washington State to fill up their cars and went back to Vancouver and, and other things like that. So it was a mild success for a while, but now they've frozen it. $35 a ton, no more increase. And now the CO2, if you look at the projections through 2025, every year carbon is going to increase. So it's the heat engine that is the amoeba, which is human society, that needs to be pricked somehow. Uh, I think the CCL thing, frankly, I hope that you guys get it through, but I'm also aware of, I think, when the economy really does turn over in this country, Bill McKibben and others are going to be blamed for, for some of that because, whoa, these coal plants, so more expensive. And if that's, if we're willing to do that, I mean, we should be willing to do anything, right, for the stakes, but it's just, it's just complicated. It's not like I'm against it, it's just that it's nuanced. Okay, we'll continue outside. <laughs>